in this video, I'm going to teach you exactly how to do spun metal paintings. When properly executed, you will learn how to do these paintings that give you so much depth, more depth than you'd ever be able to achieve on canvas or even illustration board. They almost look as if they have a holographic effect when properly done. Okay, what I have here is a sheet of 6061 aluminum. Uh, I chose 6061 because it's a very hard aluminum, but it's very easy to etch and grind to get dimension and depth in your etchings alone. But first, when you get it from your local metal supplier, uh, the edges, you have to be very, very careful. The edges are very sharp. So what I do is I get a very large, fine file, and I go around just the outskirts of the panel to dull the edges so that I won't cut my hand while I'm working with the metal. So you want to just pull your file down so that you just take the sharp edge off of the edge of the metal so that you don't cut your hand. You want to do every single corner on both sides. So just do one side at a time. And then just slowly work around the panel. It doesn't have to be perfect because when you frame your painting, you won't see any of this. And now I'm going to flip it over and do the same thing on the other side. One last side. Okay, now that you've dulled off all of your corners, it's time to start grinding your project. But I want to go over a few things first as to what I personally use. There's a lot of grinders out there that you can use and pads that you can use, but with the aluminum, you have to be careful because aluminum is very, very soft in nature. So if you use something a little too abrasive, it's going to put scratches and gouge marks in the aluminum. So when you clear coat it, on slight angles, you're going to see these gouges in the aluminum. We want this finish to look like as if your painting is under a sheet of glass. So what I've done is I found these pads at a welding supply house. You can get them there or many times a good industrial hardware store. They're generally used to grind down metal to clean it before they use a, a welder to weld the pieces together. They come in two different grits. They come in a, uh, a fine, which is the red, and you have a gray pad, which is an extra fine. I use both of these pads in my grinding techniques because I build depth and dimension solely in the grindings first. What we also want to use, and this is very, very important, is a respirator and eye protection. The aluminum dust is very, very harmful to your lungs, so you always want to have a respirator on when you're grinding. Okay, now we're just going to clean this metal real quick and then get on to our grinding. Very simplistic, just wipe it down really quick. You could also use rubbing alcohol for this if you don't have any grease and wax remover. You'll see some black sometimes on the pad or on your, uh, your paper towel. Don't be alarmed, that's just the aluminum. Then we take a dry rag and just wipe it clean and nice and dry. Okay, now we're going to start our grinding. And like I was telling you previously, it's very important to wear a respirator. So during this, I'm going to be wearing one. Uh, I'm just going to quickly explain to you what to do with the grinder. Uh, sometimes you need to get some scrap pieces of metal to practice a little bit because the way you handle the grinder will give you different shapes in the metal. You could do really wide passes by holding it a lot flatter, or if you tilt it on its side, you can get different shapes just by maneuvering the wheel over the metal as it's spinning. So what we're going to do on this particular piece is we're going to do a center swirl working its way out on the whole entire piece. And since this piece is going to be standing, when you see it, long ways, we're going to do some grindings down in the bottom coming up just to overlap to give depth and dimension in our grindings first before we do any painting. They'll be incorporated into the painting later on where you'll see them in the very, very far background.
Okay, I've done my first pass, and you always want to check your grindings. There's some spots here that were not hit because of the way I was controlling the wheel, and I thought it might look really, really attractive, but it didn't work out exactly the way I wanted to. So, but what's great about etching the metal is that with this pad, I can go back in and add more to it without you even knowing that I didn't do it initially. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put back on my equipment and just etch these empty spaces here just a little bit more and then we're going to switch the pads and go to a different type pad and do the other grindings that we're going to do to give it that depth and dimension. Okay, now that we've got our first pass of grinds finished, we're now going to change the wheel and put the softer wheel on to then put some more grindings up in this area since our painting image is going to be long ways. So we're going to do some elongated etchings and then etchings coming up and crossing over these a little bit straighter, not so curved, so it gives it a total different look and gives it more depth and dimension to your grindings before you even start your painting. First, we're going to change this pad on the grinder from the large red one, which is your fine, to your small gray one, which is extra fine. You can also get the red ones the same size as this gray one, which we're going to put on now. The advantage to the smaller ones is you can get much smaller and finer grinds. Kind of gets a little hard there uh, from it spinning so much. It's just a matter of putting it on, putting your nut back on, tightening it down. You want to make sure it's nice and tight. You don't want this thing flying off while you're doing your grinding. And then we're ready for our next pass. Notice the depth in just the grindings. These will get even more intensely noticeable when we start to put the candies and especially the clear coat on after this. This gets cleaned the same way that we cleaned it initially. And then we're going to start laying on candy concentrates by House of Color over this. 
And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay a coat, several coats, excuse me, of clear. What the clear does in my paintings, it gets more depth because I always do the background first and then I lay four layers of clear over this. Uh, only because my foreground, which I'm going to work, start out with opaques and then lay candy concentrates over that, it gives them more depth because now they're sitting on four layers of clear. They're not sitting on the initial surface of the metal. So you're building up by doing more and more layers of clear, you're building up more and more depth in your paintings, which will eventually make this painting look like it's four feet deep. Okay, before we get started in spraying our candies, I just want to go over a few things first about the equipment. What I'm going to be using today is a W100 by Iwata. It's one of their miniature spray guns. This one and the RG3 are the only two spray guns made that I know of that can actually work off of an airbrush hose. What's great about this is I got this at Coast Airbrush. It's a little tiny adapter that can go onto the bottom of the gun, which you can hook up a quick release system where you could go from airbrush to spray gun in a second. Just undo, click it on the new one, and you're ready to go. Okay, I just want to go over a few things that a lot of people neglect to show you on a lot of spray guns. You have these dials on your gun. They all have specific reasons. The top dial set your fan. This particular gun can go from a quarter inch to four and a half inch spray pattern. So you need to play with that. Many times I'll play with it a little bit before to set my gun to see exactly how wide of a fan pattern I want. If you're going to dial it down, be aware that it kind of makes it more like a straight on garden hose. So you need to hold your gun a heck of a lot farther away. But for laying the candies, you want your fan as wide as possible, and that's where I have it set at the moment. The next dial down here controls the throw of the trigger. And what that does is it controls the volume of candy that you're going to be spraying out of the, the gun. You don't want to set it too heavy because what will happen is if you lay too much candy on at one time, many times if you don't have really good gun control, it'll puddle up and you'll get dark and light spots because it's 100% transparent that you're laying down. So you want to make sure you play with that and get that set also. This dial down here sets your air pressure. You want to always spray the candies at a roughly around 50 PSI because if you have it set a little too low, your automization of the candy is going to be way too low and it's basically going to be spinning it out of the gun. If that happens, you're going to have blotchy dark specks all over your piece and it'll turn out really blotchy in the, in the long run. So you want to make sure you keep your air pressure close to 50 PSI. You also want to always hold your gun 8 to 12 inches above the surface when laying candies. You want them to fan out and lay nice on top of your surface. Always use a 75% overlap on your passes and try to always do your passes identical. So this way you don't have any mistakes and no blotchiness and you have a perfectly transparent color on top of your aluminum grinded metal. The other things I want to go over are what we're going to be using in this project. This particular product is AP01 by House of Color. It's an adhesion promoter. In layman's terms, it's glue for paint. Aluminum is not meant to be painted. If you do not use this product, what will happen is over time, your painting will start to bubble. And literally, if it continues, it will peel off like a big giant sticker. So you want to make sure you use this product on all your aluminum paintings before you get started painting. It's just a very, very light dust coat over your whole entire surface, and then just load up your gun with candy and start spraying your candy. The candy that we're going to be using is two ingredients. It's SG100 by House of Color. What this actually is, is what all of House of Color's colors start off as. It's the binder, and then they add the different colored pigments to it to make it whatever color they choose. By doing that, what we are using is Pagan Gold. It's a candy concentrate. It's basically the pigment to add into the Intercoat Clear to make it whatever color you want. So what you're going to do is you're going to take whatever amount of SG100, 20% of that amount will be your candy concentrate. 
Then you see what your total is of that, and you add one part reducer to that. So basically, it's two parts this mixture to one part reducer for house of color. If you're going to be spraying it through an airbrush, you need to reduce it one to one because the airbrush nozzle is a lot smaller than a spray gun. Spray gun has a very large tip, so you can spray thicker substances through it. We also are going to strain our candies. When we fill them into our gun, you want to always make sure you use a strainer. You don't want any contaminants to be in the candy because if that spits out onto your surface as you're spraying your candy, you pretty much have to wipe the whole thing off and start over again. Candies are very, very difficult to touch up and fix because of their transparency. If I were to get a speck and I try to get that out and then blow a little color in there, whatever color I've laid on top of that in that one particular area is going to be a heck of a lot darker now than my whole other surface. Or if I just make more passes, that one spot that I wipe that little booger off will stay a lot lighter than the rest of my surface. So you always want to make sure you strain your paint. Okay, we're going to get started painting. First, I'm going to take the gun and I'm going to fill it with AP01 adhesion promoter. I'm going to put a light dusting of that on my surface before I lay my candy. Remember, that's the glue for the candy to stick to the aluminum. If you forget that step, Pretty much wipe it all off and put the adhesion promoter on because you're going to really regret it later on. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go around the outskirts with the red, fading it slightly in so that you'll have a transition from yellow into orange into a dark red around the outside. I have apple red candy concentrate mixed with Intercoat Clear and one part reducer mixed into my gun right now. Okay, I'm just going to go over some of the things that I'm going to use right now to do the first clear coating of this panel. Now we're going to lay on about four coats tip-top clear. This way, our next session will be painted on top of the four coats of clear and not on top of the metal, so this way you build up a lot more depth in your etched metal paintings. Uh, the first thing I want to go over is a mixing cup. 
You can buy these at Coast Airbrush or any uh, auto body supply house. They're special because they have mixing ratios according to the things that you're going to be mixing right on the side of the cup. Now our clear that we're going to be using today is mixed two parts clear. You always have the paint or the clear is the first number. Two parts clear to one part hardener to zero to five percent reducer. A slight splash of reducer. I really like using this clear because of that. When you have a lot of other clears have one part reducer, which is an awful lot of reducer, and when you're dealing with artwork and graphics, many times the reducer seeps through all of those colors that you've put on, sometimes reactivating them, causing them to bleed. If they bleed, then basically you have to wait for your clear fully to dry and then go in and try and mask and touch up and then re-clear the whole entire panel again. So that's why I like using this clear because there's only a little splash of reducer so I don't run the risk of any of my paints bleeding or doing what they call dye back and that's basically burning the color where it basically disappears. So on this cup, we're going to be mixing this 2 to 1 to 0 to 5 percent. The closest measurement on here is two parts to one part to 10%. So what we will do is you see all these numbers on here? Say for instance, we want to fill up, look at the, the red passage. This is where the clear will finally be finished once all the components are mixed. So we want to mix up this much clear. We're going to start at the number four in the first line, the two parts. We're going to fill up to the number four with clear. Then from that four, we're going to follow to the next four with the hardener, two to one, one part hardener. Now since this is only 5%, we're only going to go to the middle of the two fours. The blue four and the red four, which is your last column, will be 5%. Once we've done this, we mix the clear very, very well. You can never mix your clear long enough. You have up to three hours to use this clear once it has been fully mixed, but you must use it because otherwise it'll start to gel in the cup and then you cannot spray this clear at all. When mixing clear, the ratios have to be really dead on. If they're not, you're going to run into a lot of drying problems. Okay, we're going up to the number three line. So now I've followed to the number three in the first category. And that's the two part. Now we're going to go in with one part of hardener. So we're going to go up to the next, go over one row to the one part, and we're going to fill it now to the next three in the one part. Make sure you get it right on that line. You don't want to mix too much of one product and not enough of the other. Now we're going to go to our reducer, which is the last component, and we're just going to put a little bit of a splash because you want to get in between those two threes. With this particular clear, if you over-reduce this clear, what tends to happen is it dries dull. And you don't want that, you want a nice high gloss. It's not really going to matter too much in this pass because we're going to wet sand this and then do our artwork and re-clear it again another four more times before we wet sand and buff it to our nice high gloss to look like it's under glass. You want to make sure you stir it really, really good. You don't want any of your clear unmixed because then it'll have problems with the drying. So you want to make sure this is stirred thoroughly. And I found with this clear, Many times, this clear has no yellow tint to it. So when you pour the three components into the cup, they tend to look a little foggy. And as I'm stirring it and it thoroughly mixes, the liquid becomes just like totally, totally clear. Now that we've had the clear mixed up, we're going to strain it and put it into our spray gun. You want to use the strainer always because you don't want any contaminants in your clear either. If you can see, I'm wearing this suit. I always wear a spray suit when I'm clear coating. I found in the beginning when I first started doing these paintings, I found that when I wasn't wearing the suit, I'd have dust and dirt and debris all over my clear jobs and I didn't understand why. I found out that static electricity builds up when you clear 
And if you're wearing normal street clothes, many times it pulls dirt, lint, hair right off of you and onto your panel. So I started wearing a spray suit, which you can get, this is a, a very good one. You can buy disposable ones for about seven or eight bucks. Uh, a lot of paint shops carry them. You can use them for usually a month or two at a time before you have to throw it out because it just starts you know, wearing down and getting holes in it. And I always wear rubber gloves because dirt and debris from your hands, anything can always get on your panel. This way, if you do get something in it, since you have the rubber gloves on, sometimes you can just tap it and kind of wipe it out of the way and put another little spot of clear over it and touch up a little spot. Many times everything around the surrounding areas should be relatively clean. So put new paper down if you have to. Sometimes I'll lay paper all over the floor or I'll wet the floor with water to keep the dust level down. Also when you're dealing with say doing it in your garage, many times you have to wait for just the right day. You cannot spray clear in an awfully windy day. You'll get it all in your panel. It'll look beautiful and then all of a sudden you'll have dust all over it. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna take a tack cloth and I'm gonna lightly rub the tack cloth over this surface. What that is, it's a cloth soaked in linseed oil to give it the tackiness and that picks up any dust or debris that might be on this panel as of now. Once that's done, we're just gonna do a very light dust coat and then we're gonna continue with three medium wet coats of clear. Okay, I'm gonna start the clearing process with a very, very light coat, keeping it approximately six to 12 inches above the surface just to get a nice light mist on there. I wanna also tell you that I have my gun set at approximately 55 PSI. Every clear is a little bit different depending upon the thickness of the clear, but this clear seems to flow out very nicely when it's at a higher air pressure. Next, I will be doing three more additional coats, but each coat will be more of a medium wet coat. By doing this, I do everything exactly the same as the tack coat, only I get my gun a lot closer, closer to six inches away from the surface so that I put more material onto the panel that we're doing. Once you've done that, then it's just wait for it to dry a good 12 hours before you start wet sanding. Well, it's been approximately 12 hours after we've cleared. You want to usually let it dry at least 12 to 24 hours so that it builds up enough hardness so that you can wet sand it without it gumming up the paper of your sandpaper. What I have on here is 3M 600 grit paper. I generally use 800 because when you clear it the second time, it gives it a higher gloss. But since we are filming and I want to get this done in a relatively faster manner, I'm using the 600 which will cut it a lot quicker. It still is okay. You never want to go below 600 grit because then when you do your second set of clearing and your artwork, you'll see the sand scratches through it. You also never want to go above 800 because then you're not going to have enough adhesion for your next clear job and your uh, opaque artwork that's going to be floating off of your grinded metal. So what you want to do is I generally use a spray bottle, not a bucket, because what happens with a bucket Many times that water gets really dirty and sometimes you'll get a lot of uh, debris on your paper. It never totally cleans the paper off. And the idea of the water is so that the paper doesn't get clogged as you're sanding. So you always want to keep your paper wet and your surface wet so that it'll sand nice and clean. Okay, what I have in the center of this sandpaper is what is called a sanding block. This particular block has a hard side and a soft side. And for this project, we're mainly gonna be using the hard side. Uh, we're also, what I use this for, is to squeegee off the water off my surface so I get a nice, clean uh, vision of exactly how my sanding is going. So all you do is you basically wrap the sandpaper around your block. I always put the, the hard side down in the middle, so this way I have the the open end up at the top that I'm going to hold with my hands. Wet the paper and then also wet your surface. 
And your stroke should always go in the same direction across the whole entire panel. You keep working this until you see that nice dull finish. But to see that, you have to squeegee off the water first and let it dry. Many times you'll get little tiny bits of debris, so when you squeegee off this water, you'll see little tiny shiny spots. That's where your dirt and debris is or where you haven't sanded enough. So once you've gotten the water off, let me blow on this, speed it up, and it's nice and dry, you'll look and you'll see these little tiny marks. What that is, that's dirt in your clear. Uh, and over here, I haven't sanded enough. You can see these shiny spots in the panel. So what I'll do now is I will only pinpoint these designated areas so that this way I can sand them flat so it looks like the same finish all over the top of this panel. You want to sand all of this stuff out immediately because if you don't, the next time you clear, all of that stuff is going to be stuck in there and you won't be able to get it out. You also want to sand out all the orange peel if you might have any. What orange peel is, is generally when you're spraying your clear, if you're not using enough air pressure, what tends to happen is the gun is trying to force that clear out of the gun. So it's basically spitting the clear onto the surface in little lumps, causing your whole surface to look lumpy. That's why I always use the higher air pressure so that it atomizes the clear really, really fine and sprays it on nice so this way there's no lumps so the clear can fully flow out and then it's a heck of a lot less sanding for you when you do this. But you want to sand all of that out if you do have it because if you don't, what's going to happen is the next time you clear this panel, you're only going to be adding clear to the lumps that are already on there, making those lumps even larger. So then when you go to sand it to buff it for your final uh, finish, you're going to be sanding an awful lot. This way you don't sand as much and it comes out looking like your painting is under a sheet of glass. Okay, let's see how we did here. There's just a couple little more spots but we'll just pinpoint those, get those out, do the rest of the panel, and then we'll move on to our next step. Okay, now we've finished our sanding, and you can see it's pretty dirty. So we need to pre-clean this again using the Five Star Grease and Wax Remover. Uh, we're gonna do it the same exact process as we did earlier in the video, but after this, we are going to tack rag it to clean the surface of any dust and debris before we get started laying out our ghost flames. So you get your dry one and your one that's going to do the initial wiping. You wipe the whole surface down. I like using the five star because it's not very aggressive. I've used some grease and wax removers that literally have wiped off paint. This is not the factor here because it's been clear coated, but when I use this to pre-clean in between color changes when I'm airbrushing, you have to be careful because some of them are very, very aggressive and they'll literally wipe off your artwork. So it's always best to test an area and sometimes as you'll see later on, I use a little bit of water to kind of dilute it so it's not as aggressive. This though, right out of the can, is pretty safe. A little bit of dirt there and on the corners here, a little bit of sanding buildup, but that'll come right off. Okay, now we're just going to go very lightly over this with a tack rag, just to get any little dust or lint or any little bits of sanding debris off here that might still be there, like that one right there. It doesn't have to be 100% clean, but relatively clean for what we're going to do next, because you're going to be laying masking down on this and you want it to be able to stick very well. Okay, now we've cleared our panel with several coats of Tip Top Clear. I've wet sanded it with 800 grit sandpaper and now we're going to get ready to lay out our ghost flames which will be in the background of my drawing. 
I've drawn up this tiki and flame design. We're gonna cut out the foliage just for this video since we're on a time frame, but we're gonna do a monochromatic tiki in the center with two torches crisscrossing in the background with realistic flames coming up out of the torches. But I have this flame design in the background, which I'm gonna do in a ghost flame. So it looks very, very subtle in the background, but when the lights hit it, it'll appear. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna to explain to you what I'm gonna be using. This is called Auto Mask. You can get this at Coast Airbrush. A lot of people also use this for vinyl transferring of letters. And you still can use this for that, but we've done a lot of testing on different products and we had to come up with our own because we were finding out that working with the regular transfer tape, many times your paint, when you lay it down, it'll bleed through the paper causing it to reactivate the glue and leaving a gluey mess all over your panel. Also, it does not bleed underneath the paper, which a lot of times they do. You can't use like papers such as Frisk because that's designed for illustration with water-based paint. Use that with the automotive, the solvents attack it and it just doesn't work very good for you. First, we're gonna lay out our flame design with blue fine line tape. This tape is designed so it's very flexible it moves and bends very easily to lay out our flames. So we're going to lay this out first, then we're going to apply the auto mask on top of it and then cut out our flames. The reason why I use this mainly is not only because it makes a nice design and clean design in the flame since we're not going to be pinstriping this, but it also acts as a buffer. So when you're cutting your auto mask, you don't run the risk of cutting into your metal surface, leaving a nice little cut mark. And you want to cut it that way because with ghost flames, you're not going to be pinstriping it so that you can hide those cut marks. We're going to use a squeegee to squeegee down the auto mask, to flatten it out and to get all of the bubbles out of our auto mask so that we don't have any possibilities of what they call blow-by, where the paint gets up underneath the paper and causes it to stick then to your surface, which you'd have to then remove. But since it's been cleared, if that should happen, you don't have to worry about it because a little lacquer thinner or a little fine sandpaper, you could sand that right off. And then of course you're gonna use an X-Acto blade with a brand new blade. Always work with new blades because the sharp blades cut it very, very easily where you don't have to press as hard, running the risk of possibly cutting through all of your tape and into your surface. So let's get started laying out our flames. After quite a few years of practicing this, I'm able to lay this out without having to draw it down on my surface. Sometimes you can take a piece of regular blackboard chalk and draw it on there very lightly and come in and have a guide then to lay your fine line tape over if you have problems working with the blue fine line. It does take a little bit of practice to get used to working with this stuff, but once you you've mastered it, you could lay out a set of flames very, very quickly. Sometimes if you feel that the flame isn't going the way you want, you can pull this tape up very easily and reposition it, which you just saw me do. Sometimes you have to get this knack of flowing with the tape and letting it go where it seems to want to go because if you tend to bend this tape too much, what will happen, especially in warmer conditions, it'll start to pull up on your tight, tight bends if you really bend it a lot and stretch it. So we try not to do that too much because we don't want to have any possible gaps for the paint to bleed under. My fingers are squeaking from the friction of my hands on the tape. Sometimes they'll put baby powder on their hands. Pinstripers do this as well, so that their hands slide along the surface a lot easier. Now that we've completed our blue fine line, we're now ready to lay down our auto mask. And I usually take a squeegee and I roll it 
as I squeegee it down, always squeezing it towards the open part of the roll, because that's where you can just get the air to escape so it goes down nice and flat without any air pockets. Sometimes it's a little difficult to work with this on a curved surface, but since this paper is so fine and so thin, you're able to squeegee it down and just get little tiny fine hair lines which reduce the risk of getting any major, major blow bys. You might get some little tiny ones, but many times you can either take that off with a little fine piece of sandpaper, or even many times I've used a typewriter eraser. Those really hard erasers, they tend to work really well as long as the paint hasn't had a lot of time to set up. Take the X-Acto knife and we just trim it right off the edge. And I tend to like to trim all of my edges immediately so this way I don't run the risk of pulling any of this up when I flip this around to do the other side. You can just run your blade right along the edge and it cuts it nice and clean. You want to put a little bit of an overlap and what we'll do is since this is a little bit wider than our tape, we won't use this again. We'll just take a piece of masking tape and mask off that last little edge. Okay, now that I've put a brand new blade in my X-Acto knife, I'm very lightly going over the middle of the blue fine line tape. This blue fine line, like I was telling you before, acts as a buffer. So this way, if you do press a little too hard, you'd have to press relatively very hard to cut through not only your auto mask, but your blue fine line. And when you're doing ghost flames, it's very, very important that you cut very, very lightly because if you don't, you run the risk of cutting into your clear coat that you put on the piece. And when you're done, you will see those cut marks all around your flame job because when you paint the flames, they're going to go on the inside of your blue fine line tape and then you'll have a cut mark going through the center of it. Okay, now that we've finished all of our cutting of our flames, we're ready to start peeling off what we've just cut. Just find your closest edge. And what I tend to do is I peel relatively slowly to make sure that I've cut totally through enough. Uh, sometimes if you don't cut just right, you'll get these little teeny tiny bits of glue that don't seem to want to let go. If you were to just tear this off, you run the risk of pulling off your masking or possibly pulling the glue out from underneath the paper, leaving a big open gap with no glue that blow by could possibly happen. So what I'll do is I'll just very lightly recut over that one particular area so that we can just peel that off and continue peeling off our flame. Okay, you want to really take your time doing this. Don't rush it. And then what you can do later on is after you get this off, you can go back and just rub those areas of that little bit of glue residue and that'll rub right off. Here's another little section. Just recut it lightly and peel it up. First, we're going to just crease down all of the edges just to make sure that there are no little tiny air gaps that paint might be able to seep under, causing us some blow bys. And then after we've completed this, we'll mix up some pearl and spray down our ghost flame. First, we're gonna take a tack rag and we're gonna wipe down the surface just to make sure there's no contaminants or dust on top of our design that we're gonna spray this pearl. You don't want to rub too hard because some of the oil that is on the tack cloth that comes that way, that's what gives it its stickiness, will come off onto your surface. And if that happens, when you start to spray your pearl, it'll tend to fish eye because the solvents of your paint will mix with the oil that's on there, causing it to, to blotch up and fish eye. For those of you who don't know what a fisheye is, it's when there's a contaminant on your surface like oil from the rag which will react to the paint causing it to separate off the surface. 
And you don't want that to happen because then that'll show up in your final paint job. Okay, what I've mixed up here now is a little summertime green pearl with some Intercode Clear. And then I take that mixture and whatever amount I have, I mix one part reducer to that. We're gonna fog it around the edges of the flame. We're going for a ghost flame. So you just very lightly are gonna put pearl all around the outskirts of your tape marks. Depending upon the type of pearl that you'll be spraying, sometimes you really won't see it at all. Like this pearl is very, very translucent. So it's kind of hard to see over the colors. But after we take the tape off, it'll stand out like a sore thumb. You have to be careful. Sometimes it's only going to happen with practice as to where to stop uh, laying on your pearl. You don't want to go too heavy because then it's going to stand out an awful lot. It, but if that's, you know, what you're going for, then, you know, just keep laying it on. A little bit goes a long way and many times you really won't see the true color. It'll get a lot brighter once the clear coat is put on. We don't want to build up too much of a ridge also, so then later on when we clear coat, it'll just get buried in a couple coats of clear that we're going to put on. But we just want this very subtle flame design to be in the background of our design. And I'm holding the gun pretty far away, so this way when it goes on, it goes on nice and soft and it'll fill the area a lot quicker. If I get a lot closer, then it's gonna make it more of a line, and I don't want that. I just want a very soft fade that is gonna go from the outside of the blue fine line and very subtly come into the center of the flame design, fading out totally so you can't even see it. And then that's it. Okay, now we're ready to unmask our design and see how it turned out. I usually start very slowly pulling off the auto mask. This looks like it's going to be a nice subtle design. You're barely going to see it, but it'll pop once we put the clear on. But you can kind of see the color difference from here to here, which will make it a nice subtle lime green ghost flame. Now's the time when you're going to see your flame really stand out as we pull off this blue fine line. As you can see how nice and subtle this flame is. We pretty much nailed it. Once the clear goes on, it'll intensify the color, having it show up a little bit more than it is now. You can see by the way I'm moving this panel, how the light, because of the different angles of light that hit it, makes it totally disappear. And then as I lean it forward and it changes the angle of light, it totally appears. That's the beauty of working with pearls and doing them very, very lightly. Is I've taken an autograph projector and I've projected the image onto our auto mask, which I relayed down on top of our flames that we laid out. I just did a pencil drawing of exactly what I wanted and now I'm going to go in and cut all these lines kind of like an illustrator does. We're kind of making almost like a template, like a freehand template, but out of the masking tape. We're just going to lightly dust in color to see exactly where everything's positioned, then peel all this off and do everything freehand so it doesn't look like one big stencil. You want to kind of cut very gently on this as well. If you cut a little too deep, you will put cut marks in your clear. And technically, it really doesn't matter so much because you're going to be laying paint over it. But if they are really, really deep, your paint will not hide that cut mark. You'll eventually see you'll have paint with a thin, thin line going down the middle of it. And if you notice when I'm doing this, I don't ever lift my blade. So this way I don't leave little stragglers later on when we peel this off where they'll be connected and give me a tough time. Now that everything has been cut, we're going to start peeling out a section at a time and just laying in a little bit of color so that we know exactly where everything is positioned. After that, we'll take off all of the masking and then go in freehand and start painting our imagery. I'm just doing this to kind of give me an exact positioning of where everything belongs. So this way when I come in freehand, it won't look as if it was stenciled or taped off. So we're going to start by peeling out little tiny sections at a time.
before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start just very lightly fogging in some white color around the outskirts of my design, kind of sculpting it slightly, just so that later on we won't have as much work with our shadowing and shading when we do this with the white paint to make it look as if it's been actually painted and not used as a stencil. So this way it'll look like it's all been freehanded. But for the bamboo, that little bit of yellow shining through really helps it out. Because bamboo, that's basically the colors. It's got a yellow tint to it. So that'll help us out in the long run if we don't hide it all. And see here how we have that nice distinctive line? When I come in and fog in the bottom of this, it'll look like an actual piece of bamboo because you'll have that semi-hard line there. You don't want to really be too concerned with doing a lot of detail on this part. We just want to get a positioning of where everything's going to go. Once we peel off all of our masking, then we'll start doing all of the detail and all of the fine tuning of this piece. So I'm just slowly filling this in. You don't have to go too heavy because later on we might put in a little bit of wood grain to kind of make this look like a real wooden tiki. Now I've peeled out a lot more of my section. And before I start to paint in these areas, I just want to point out something. If you can notice, you can see where we've laid our pearl for our flames. Now I laid the pearl very, very lightly where you cannot feel any kind of ridge. If you were to put this on a lot heavier and you got a ridge, what you would need to do is you could take just a little bit of lacquer thinner and just saturate the area and then with another towel wipe it totally off since your base has been clear coated. If you didn't clear coat your base and you did that, you would wipe off everything. So you have to be careful. That's another good reason why I clear coat my whole entire background first so that this way if I make any mistakes on my foreground, I could just wipe them off with a little bit of lacquer thinner. But since we've gone so nice and soft, when we lay paint over this, it will totally hide it. If the ridge was too high, when we would lay paint over it, you would see a distinctive line as to where your flame is. So you want to be careful with checking things like that out. You could wipe it off with lacquer thinner like I just described, or you could even come in with some 800 wet sandpaper and just lightly sand off that edge, whichever feels best for you. But we don't need to do it on this particular piece because I've laid the pearl on so nice and soft. So I'm going to go in now and paint these areas that I peeled out. Now that I've peeled out these sections, we're going to come in and paint them. Then we'll peel it again, and this will probably be the last time that we need to peel anything out. We'll peel those sections out, paint those sections, and then unmask the whole entire piece and start all our freehand airbrushing. Okay, now I'm going to come in and paint the torches. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a little choppy design real quick in here just to kind of give it some texture. It's just to give you a rough idea and just to put a little depth in the torch because we want the torches to kind of look pretty realistic. Because what I'm going to do is after I unmask all of this, I'm going to come back in and freehand do the fire and the big flames coming up off of these torches. They're all dagger strokes. It's very important to learn this good control of the gun because you basically use them for just about everything that you do. It's probably the one stroke that you'll use the most when airbrushing. Just a little highlighting around the edges just to give it a little bit of roundness and depth. Now we're just going to peel out this last piece and just lightly fog that in. See how fast this dries? 
you just sometimes, depending upon your weather conditions also, you have to be careful. Usually it dries relatively quickly to the touch like that, but it also depends on how you're laying it on. I'm doing very, very light mist. I found a little teeny tiny piece of tape in the corner of one of the torches. If I would have left that there and cleared over my whole panel, you would have seen that. It would have stood out like a sore thumb. So that's why it's so very, very important to go over your panel to make sure you get off every last little piece of tape. Generally, I'll run my hands over the whole entire surface because many times you can feel things a lot better than you can see them. Okay, now comes the fun part. Now is when we start to do all of our freehand airbrushing to really make this thing come alive. We're only going to do it with the white first and then we're going to come in later on and lay in some candy concentrates. But when you're painting this with the white, you want to kind of think in your head that this is the only color that you have to work with. So you're going to do all your shadowing and shading, saving you time later on when you lay on your candies. So we're going to start off with going around all these edges so this way they're nice and soft, giving it a unstenciled look. So it looks like we just painted the whole entire piece. If you want to put some cracks and stuff in here, now is the time to do it so this way you know exactly where to go when you start laying down your other candy colors. If you don't know what bamboo really looks like, maybe find some references. And uh, many times bamboo, what it'll do is, is it, as it gets dry, it gets brittle. So it tends to crack many times. So you want to put those cracks in there, kind of make it as realistic as possible. Also when you're dealing with round objects, you tend to um, put highlights in the center because the light is going to hit it and that's usually going to be your brightest spot is right in the center and then it'll fade out and get a little bit darker on the edges. And remember, like in this area right here, you don't want to lose this line here. So make sure we continue with that because what we'll do is when we lay in our candies, we'll put shadows below this, making the tiki then stand away from the bamboo. Now what I'm going to start doing also while I'm doing this is here and there I'm going to lay in some simulated looking wood grain. You're going to continue putting your wood grain throughout the whole piece as well. Just here and there. You don't want to go too crazy on the wood grain because you don't want to take away from the actual tiki itself. The pagan gold that we laid down initially is really working out well for us because of the tiki is going to be mostly brown with a little bit of pagan gold in it, so it's going to blend in nicely with our wood grain. Every once in a while, maybe step back away from your piece, look at it and see what it might need or where you can possibly put another grain where it's not going to look a little too overdone. Now we're going to start on the fire on the torches, the realistic looking fire. So what I generally do is you try and get a good reference, but since I've done this a few times, I kind of know how the fire looks. It's, it's usually almost like an automotive flame, but chunkier. Big chunks of fire usually come off of a torch, and it's, you get these big shapely bursts of flames. But if you can, get a good reference and just really study it well. Fire is not difficult to do, uh, so always keep the flames going up. And then also remember, 
as they come to the top, you're going to have little wisps of smoke coming off from them burning. So you want to lay all of that in right now as well. You know, wiggle them around because usually with the movement of, say, if there's wind or, or anything blowing in the air, it's going to kind of have a, a motion. And this way it gives your torch a little bit more life, like it looks like it's actually moving. And then you can put little tiny wisps, you know, as if they're falling off of the torch, burning, you know, the burning embers from the torch are just falling down off of this. And then once we clear this, these will look like they're floating right up off your metal panel. That's how you get the, the illusion of a hologram with these paintings, is by painting the opaque colors on top of your grinded candy colors. If you don't do this, then you're not going to get that real depth in your paintings. And always remember also, don't get too close to this edge here because your frame is going to cover part of that. If you ever were to get your pictures framed, you always want to have everything going on in front of your frame, never hidden behind it. Okay, well we're going to do the same technique now on the other torch and then we're going to get ready to start laying some candies. Okay, now I'm going to get ready to pre-clean my surface after I've done all of this white. You want to do this because then you get to wipe off all of the overspray that happened from laying down this white. So this way when you lay your candies down, they don't look all grainy because of all that overspray on there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some grease and wax remover. And what that does is it takes off any contaminants that might be on your surface, such as dirt, grease, uh, grease from your hands, any of the overspray. But what we do is we tend to take a, a spray bottle with water and we mist it over the surface first. This dilutes the grease and wax remover so that it's not so aggressive and might possibly, if you don't do that, wipe off some of your actual airbrushing. We'll pour a little bit of grease and wax remover on this towel and just put a light mist of water on our surface. And then we'll just wipe over our artwork. And the water mixes with the grease and wax remover or the pre-cleaner, dilutes it so it's not so aggressive running the risk of wiping off any of your paint. You just want to wipe this really, really good and then you're going to come back with a dry paper towel and dry it all off. Because we're using a paper towel, we're going to come back in and use a tack rag to take off any possible lint debris that the paper towel has left behind. Once you're finished tacking this off, then you're ready to start shooting your candies. Okay, I've loaded up my gun now with some Pagan Gold House of Color candy, which I've mixed one to one. It is like we discussed before, it's SG100, which is Intercoat Clear. 20% of what I mixed up is Pagan Gold candy. And what I'm doing here is just for the bamboo, I'm laying in a nice golden yellow tone so that when I come over with my browns, it'll look like a yellowish bamboo. You just slowly build up your colors because these are 100% transparent. Always remember that because what's going to happen is the more you put on, the darker it's going to get. So you actually control how dark or how light they look. So now we're starting to lay in our brown tones and this is going to take a, a little bit of time because the whole entire painting except for our torches up top is going to get some of this brown and I'm going to start to really sculpt and shape this whole entire painting with this color. It's when you start to lay in your darker colors that's when your piece starts to come alive because you're able to shadow and shade the object to give it that depth and dimension. And what's cool about the candies is that with this one color brown, I could make probably hundreds of shades of the same color just by layering more and more paint over it. I can make it darker or I could just 
do one coat and make it very light and very subtle. Now don't forget to cut in your grains, your very light grains in your wood. You want to make these different shades, some dark, some light, you know, to give your wood a lot of depth and dimension here. And don't forget, you need to go through all your objects with your wood grain because it starts off as a big block of wood before it's carved. You won't notice it so much now, but later on when we come back over with our really dark brown and carve in that very inner corner, that's when this whole thing will just pop right out. Now you can see how we're coming along with this first shade of brown. And once we lay in that darker color, We'll just mist a little bit over this as well, so this way it'll darken it up even more than the rest of the piece. But you can kind of see right now even that this nose is starting to really pop out. You might have to go back every once in a while and accentuate the wood grain in here if you lose it after shadowing and shading over it. And then once we come back with our darker color and go over this, this will really look deep down in that wood. Okay, now what I've done is I've mixed up some violet candy and a little bit of black base coat in with my initial pagan gold and root beer mixture darkening up that original color. This way it stays all in the same uh, tones on my piece. And what we're going to do is we're going to start laying in all our shadows and shading now. You're not going to use very much of this like you did the other colors because you're going to remember where your light's coming from. So on the opposite sides is going to be darker. And this almost looks black but it's not, it's just a very, very dark brown. That's what the violet and the touch of black will do to it. I'm gonna get a shadow here from the tiki mask overlapping on top of your bamboo. And usually it'll be the darkest and then it'll start to fade out as the shadow goes down. Now you want to get in nice and tight on this because you want a nice clean line to show your shadow. And very lightly you're going to go in these shadowing spots. And that just makes that nose just look totally round. Now I'm just going to put some more little dagger strokes of this dark brown in our torch to kind of give it that look of it burning. It usually gets nice and black when it burns, so we need to add a little bit of color in here so when we put in our red and yellow and orange candy, it'll stand out a little bit more. You're not going to cover this solidly because you want to leave some room for those candies to shine through 
to make it look like the torch is burning. I have now put pagan gold like we originally used on our tiki torches back into the airbrush. I'm going to lay that down first over our whole entire torch and little pieces that have fallen off. Then we're going to come back in with some red, apple red, and by using the apple red I'll be able to highlight it on there where I'll get red and orange at the same time. It doesn't have to be perfect. you know. Fire has a little bit of white showing through here and there where they're really, really hot spots. And you don't want to go too far up because that's supposed to be your smoke. Don't forget your little hot pieces that are flying off. Okay, this looks good. Now we'll go over to our other torch and do the same thing. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to also put a little bit of this yellow on the tiki torches and along the top half of the tiki so it actually looks as if the torches are glowing on top of this tiki. It'll mainly only be towards the top half of the tiki because as it goes down the light is going to slowly diminish and get darker. So you don't want to go too far down the tiki and do every single spot. Just a little bit, just to bring some of the background color into your foreground. Now I put the red, apple red candy, in my gun. And I'm going around just the outer edges of our flames. You'll also use this red very lightly if you spray it on. The red will mix, since it's transparent, the red will mix with the yellow and make an orange hue. So you'll use this red to build depth in the insides of your flames. A couple of those little dagger strokes here and there to show hot spots on the torch. Now I'm about to pull out some highlights. What I've mixed up is some House of Color white 
with a little bit of the pagan gold candy in it to tone it down a little bit so that it looks like it's the hot spots of the fire in the torches. And it's not usually like a regular highlight, it's just little tiny dots. And then also in our fire, we need to put some of these as well, because there'll be hot spots in there to go along with the torch. Now remember, don't go too heavy and too many, because less is more. You don't want this thing to look really white. Okay, now we're going to go over to our other torch, and then it's time to sign our piece of artwork and put the final clear coat on. Let's see. Be careful as to where you put these. You want to remember that your torches, where they're positioned, and I think that's about it. We don't want to do too much more. All you have to do now is sign your piece and do your final clear coating. I'm Mark Remling and thank you for watching.